Hello everybody and welcome to this very poorly lit video. <laughs> but that's okay, you're not going to be looking at this for very much longer. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do today is um, do the next installment in the USA Poetry thing. And so today we're going to be doing, as you saw in the title of the video, we're going to be doing Ginsburg and the Ferlinghetti. I'm going to have the captions on and they're auto-generated. So they're not going to be 100% accurate, probably, but for some reason or another, the audio on this episode is really poor. It's just kind of muddy. So I just want those down there because like when I was watching it, I couldn't necessarily understand everything that was being said and the subtitles helped. Okay, like even though I knew when some of the words were wrong, so we're gonna kind of just go with it and see what happens here. So let's jump into this. NET presents. Nope. Okay, let me fix this. USA Poetry. Oh, wait, no, I have to fix it here. This program is devoted to the work of Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. This bearded figure is not an Indian holy man, but an American poet who, according to many, has written the most influential poem in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Boo! The title of the poem, published in 1957, is Howell, and the poet Howell. is Allen Ginsberg. In the tradition of Rachel Lindsay and Carl Sandberg, he is a genuinely popular poet, and is credited with returning to American poetry the scope and human compassion of a Walt Whitman. This is really bad. But within the realities of the increasingly disoriented urban experience of today. Who to be kind to? Be kind to yourself. It is only one and perishable of many on the planet. Thou art that one that wishes a soft finger tracing the line of feeling from nipple to pubis. One that wishes a tongue to kiss your armpit. A lip to touch your cheek inside your whiteness body. It really goes like Be this. kind to yourself, Harry Watch him. Because unkindness comes when the body explodes, napalm, cancer. And the deathbed in Vietnam is a strange place to dream of palm trees leaning over an angry American faces, grinning with sleepwalk terror over your last eye. Be kind to yourself, because the bliss of your own kindness will flood the police tomorrow. Because the cow weeps in the field and the mouse weeps in the cat hole. Because the rain comes over Guatemala and washes all the god statues away in the next thousand years. Be kind to this place, which is your present habitation, with derrick and radar tower and flower in the ancient brook. Be kind to your neighbor who weeps solid tears on the television sofa. He has no other home and hears nothing but the hard voice of telephone. Click, buzz, switch channel, and the inspired melodrama disappears, and he's left alone for the night. He disappears in bed. Be kind to your disappearing mother and father, gazing out the terrace window as milk truck and hearse turn the corner and say no goodbye. Be kind to the politicians, weeping in the galleries of Whitehall, Kremlin, White House, Louvre, and Phoenix Terrace, aged, large nose, angry, nervously dialing the bald voice box connected to electrodes underground, converging through wires vaster than a kitten's eye can see on the mushroom-shaped earlobe under the ear of the sleeping Dr. Einstein. Crawling with worms, crawling with worms, like that. crawling with worms, the hour has come. Yeah. Sick, dissatisfied, unloved, the bulky forehead <laughs> of Captain, Premier, President, Sir, Comrade, dear. Be kind to the fearful one in front of you who remembers the lamentations of the Bible 
and the prophecies of the crucified Adam, son of all the porters and char men of Belgravia. Be kind to yourself who weep under the moon and hide your bliss hairs under raincoat and suede Levi. For this is the joy to be born, the kindness received through strange eyeglasses on a bus in Kensington, the finger touch of the Londoner on your thumb that borrows a light for your cigarette. The smile of morning at Newcastle Central Station when long-haired, calm, blonde husband greets the bearded stranger of telephone. <laughs> and the boom bomb that bounces in the joyful bowels as the Liverpool minstrels of Cavern Saint raise up their joyful voices and guitars in electric Africa for Jerusalem. The saints come marching in, twist and shout. The gates of Eden are named in Albion again. Hope sings a black psalm from Nigeria, and a white psalm echoes in Detroit and re-echoes from Nottingham to Prague. And a Chinese psalm will be heard if we all live our lives for the next six decades. Be kind to the Chinese psalm and the red transistor in your breath. Be kind to the monks in the five spot who plays low chord bangs on his vast piano, lost in space on a stool and hearing only himself in the nightclub universe. Be kind to the heroes that have lost their names in the newspaper and hear only their own supplication for love, the peaceful kiss of sex in the giant auditoriums of planets. Hear only the myriad nameless voices crying for kindness in the orchestra, crying for hope of their own joy, screaming in anguish that bliss come true, and birds sing another hundred years to their white-haired babes, and poets be fools of their own desire. Oh, and Macrion and Angelico Shelley guide these new nipple generations on spaceships to Mars' next universe. The prayer is to man and girl the only lord of the kingdoms of feeling, Christ of their own living ribs. Ginsburg first came to prominence in the mid-50s yeah, we're gonna in San Francisco. This. When... <sighs> now again, like, I obviously think that his poems are too long. And when I said that about Anne Sexton, a few people got upset. Here's the thing. This is just a me thing. This is a... Um, What's the word I'm looking for here? Like a like a taste thing. Okay. I like it when a poet can get straight to the point, saying it beautifully, breaking my heart beautifully, but getting to the point and being able to tell me exactly what they're trying to get across and have it, like, hit and hit me like I just got, like slammed in the face of the baseball bat that to me is the best kind of poetry okay simple concise beautiful heartbreaking face smashing okay now ginsburg in that ridiculously long poem like with ann sexton had some amazing lines there were some lines in there that were just off the charts, okay? But Ginsburg does this thing, and it, I don't know if it's his heritage or what, but it's like, like, it's not even proclamations, it's like a sermon. Like, imagine, like, you're at church, whatever your religion is, you're at church, and you're sitting there, and it's early in the morning and you look up in the pulpit or the podium or whatever the fuck your religion does. And there's just someone going like this and telling you what you're supposed to do. It is just a lot, you know. I have a love-hate relationship with Ginsburg, but over the last couple years, it's been way more love than hate. But the motherfucker's long-winded. Like, the motherfucker loved Leaves of Grass, and 
he's fucking long-winded. But that that's fine. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. But he, he reads like he's giving a sermon. It's it's fascinating. Like, I honestly think, like, maybe he missed his calling. Like, I'm glad he became a poet and all that shit. But he seems like he could have fucking nailed, like, being like a fucking rabbi or a priest or a fucking whatever, you know? Like, he's very good at wagging that finger. And I know it was part of the fun. But I just, I love how much fun he has when he reads his poems. Like, he's looking around, smiling. He's having a blast. And I really wish more poets would feel that way when they read. Like, that they fucking really enjoy reading. Not enjoy performing, but enjoy reading. It's just, it's fucking refreshing. Which is sad, because this was in fucking 1966. It was refreshing in 1966. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, let's let's do this. He and other poets of the so-called Beat Generation gave public readings. A painting by Robert Levine provides a visual record of this period. So this is Forster's Cafeteria, a vision of Forster's Cafeteria around the year 1956, which would be 10 years ago, when many of us who were poets or painters were living together uh, upstairs in, in Wentley's Hotel. Look at that. This is downstairs from Wentley's Hotel, where John Wieners wrote the Hotel Wentley poem. At that time, I had just met Peter Orlovsky, and without a beard, was working in market research downtown on Montgomery Street. I was wearing a tie, a striped tie. Uh, we used to come downstairs and have coffee, uh, many of us all t- together. Behind my head is Martin Baer, who is now dead, who was a painter, and Nadia Piaskowska, who was his girlfriend. And this, with Sheila Boucher, a girl that I was in love with at that time. Over here, Neil Cassidy. This being 1955 or 56, On the Road by Kerouac was written already. Neil at that time had been the heroic prototype for the hero Dean Moriarty. Had been in love with a girl who had committed suicide that year. So her shadow, or her shade, or her naked ghost hovers throughout the cafeteria in the painting. She's playing a flute and has the the horns of Pan on his head. Over here, Michael McClure as a young man in deep, earnest conversation with the poet Philip Lamentia. It was about the same time as this painting was conceived that Lamentia, McClure, uh, myself, um, Philip Whalen, Gary Snyder, uh, with Kenneth Rexroth as a moderator, got together and gave a reading at the Sixth Gallery in San Francisco, where I first read Howell, and where all of us as a poetic group all got together on the same stage with Kerouac in the audience, with Neil Cassidy in the audience. Crazy. Uh, with uh, McClure reading poems by uh, Charles Olson and uh, Robert Creeley, whom we had not yet met, and presented here before the public for the first time, like a united front of pure angelic poetry. I looked very naive there to myself. Uh, well, I had just arrived here in San Francisco. I must have been here maybe about a year. When I arrived here, I had a beard, but then I shaved it off because I had to get a job down in Montgomery Street. It is like Okay, real quick, let me interject again. I really want to lay into something here. And I'm gonna come to the big screen here. I want to really push you guys on the idea of how important a small event can become. And just like that sex pistol show that had like members of like the sex pistols played someplace and in the crowd was like the people who would end up forming the clash and joy division and um, a couple other bands. Can't remember who it's such a big deal. Just like people used to go see X and ended up being the germs, black flag, 
um, circle jerks, you know, the whole fucking thing. This right here, he just said, yeah, they were hanging out at some coffee shop. And I'm like, hey, you know what we should do? We should all get together and like read our poetry. That'd be fucking crazy, right? We should do that. So Ginsburg, um, Lamantia, who I always thought his name was pronounced La Mancha, um, Gary Snyder, uh, Kenneth Rexroth, Roth, Kenneth Rexroth, and a bunch of other people go and do this poetry reading, and fucking Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy are in the fucking audience, and they started the the beats. On accident, just because th- they were bored and wanted to have a poetry reading. Like, if you have any kind of scene, whether it is physical or fucking virtual, put together events. Because doing little things like this can change the whole scope of what you're doing, okay? These little moments are the important periods because no one knows that they're doing something important until like 10 years later when historians are fucking looking back at it and they could trace it back to a moment, okay? Moments are huge. They are everything. So if you're not making moments, you're letting time pass you by. That's all I'm going to say about it. I, I, I Probably that's not true. I'll probably say a lot more, but yeah. Is that Allen Ginsberg is better known throughout the world than any other American poet. In 1965, he was in Eastern Europe and in Czechoslovakia was crowned King of the Student May Festival, only to be expelled a few days later by the Czech government. 10.30 in the morning, I was busted by the uh, Czechoslovakian security police and told that my presence was corrupting Czechoslovakian youth, so my visa was discontinued, and then put me on a plane in the afternoon to London. So I got on a plane, and on the plane, wrote poem about the situation. And I am the king of May, which is Prowl Mayalat in the Czechoslovakian tongue. And I am the king of May, which is old human poetry, and a hundred thousand people chose my name. And I am the king of May, and in a few minutes I will arrive at London Airport. And I am the king of May, naturally, for I am of Slavic parentage, and a Buddhist Jew who worships the sacred heart of Christ, the blue body of Krishna, the straight back of Ram, the beads of Chango, the Nigerian, singing Shiva Shiva in a manner which I had invented. And the King of May is a middle European honor, mine in the 20th century, despite spaceships and the time machine, because I heard the voice of Blake in a vision and repeat that voice. And I am the King of May that sleeps with you. And I am the King of May that I may be expelled from my kingdom with honor as of old to show the difference between Caesar's kingdom and the kingdom of the May of man. And I am the king of May, though paranoid, for the kingdom of May is too beautiful to last for more than a month. And I am the king of May because I touched my finger to my forehead, saluting that beautiful girl with trembling hands who said, one moment, Mr. Ginsburg, before a fat young policeman stepped between our bodies. I got a billion hands to spend this year, so I got a little money, so I'll buy a little Volkswagen microbus. Uh, with Peter Olofsky, who is a friend of mine that I've been living with for work, and his brother, who came out of a bug house after being in a bug house 11 years. So we'll all go in a microbus and visit Detroit. <laughs> I've been in Detroit, in uh, Ocatello, in New Orleans, see what's happening in the United States. It, can't be as bad as it sounds in the newspapers and Before leaving on the trip across the United States, Ginsburg and Peter Orlovsky had agreed to sit for a portrait by Robert Levine. I suppose you could say it was a kind of musical sitting.
In the notes for a recording of Howell and other poems released in 1959, Allen Ginsberg wrote this about his poetic. By 1955, I wrote poetry adapted from prose seeds, journals, and scratchings, arranged by phrasing or breath groups into little short line patterns according to ideas of measure of American speech I'd picked up from William Carlos Williams' Images Preoccupation. I suddenly turned aside in San Francisco unemployment compensation leisure to follow my romantic inspiration, Hebraic Melvillian Bardic Breath. I thought I wouldn't write a poem, but just write what I wanted to without fear. Let my imagination go, open secrecy, and scribble magic lines from my real mind, sum up my life, something I wouldn't be able to show to anybody, write for my own soul's ear mm -hmm. and a few other golden ears. That's awesome. But how sustain a long line in poetry, lest it lapse into prosaic? It's natural inspiration of the moment that keeps it moving, disparate things put down together, shorthand notations of visual imagery, juxtaposition of hydrogen jukebox, abstract haikus, sustain the mystery, and put iron poetry back into the line. Finally, completely free composition, the long line breaking up within itself into short staccato breath units. Notations of one spontaneous phrase after another, linked within the line by dashes, mostly. The long line now perhaps a variable stanzaic unit, measuring groups of related ideas, marking them, a method of notation, ending with a hymn in rhythm similar to the synagogue death chant. At least the ear hears itself in Promethean natural measure, not in mechanical count of accent. I like that. I don't like this music, but I like what he said. This painting's actually amazing for how he's doing it. It gets better, guys. Hang on. Hang, hang, hang tight. Yeah. New York to San Francisco on the airplane. And the plane bobbed back and forth like a boat at Kennedy Asphalt Space Station, glass building, taking off from Earth to fly the day after Stevenson did die. Heart attack on Grosvenor Square, July sunset, leaky calm. And I, oh, mo, mo, etc., repeat my prayer. After devouring the New York Post, the radars revolve in their solitude. Are you able to listen while I'm... I mean, does that distract or does that help? Oh, I mean, you're not supposed to. Okay. Once more, or these states scanning the cities and fields. Once more for the Rockies to look down on my own Burmese history. Once more the roar of life insurance. Murmuring in the empty plains. Five hour, 20 minute glimpse. The most beautiful mantra, Haryom Namo Shiva. And the vibration of Shiva in my belly merges with a groan of machine flying into the milky sky. If we should crash, the flops of bloody skin won't be singing that sweet song. Once more, green puddles of morse in the messy gray bay. Once more, wingtip listening to the sun and whine of dynamos in the stunned ear and shafts of light on the page in the airplane cabin. Once more, the cities of cloud advancing over New York. Once more, the houses parked like used car lots in myriad row lots. I plugged in the Jetorama Theater sterilized earphones. It's Wagner, the ride of the Valkyries. We're above the clouds. The sunlight flashes on a giant bay. Earth is below us. The horns of Siegfried sound gigantic in my ear. 
The banks of silver clouds like mountain ranges. I spread my giant green map on the air table. The, cur- the Hudson curved below to the floor drop of the world. Mountain range after mountain range. Thunder above thunder. Cumulus after cumulus. World after world of worn. In the ears with the Rhine journey, basses. And once more, the brasses. I mean, the forest. Oops, the great music button. The long, serious horns of Beethoven, the spacey, sublime charges of ether and drumbeat ascending and descending the empty Eternitas free. Click. Switch the channel. Surf, surf music. Lee, Plunk of Hawaii. I can feel the moons, all seven of them, rising over the Mauna Loas of my grammar school decade. Orange moons, green moons, blue moons, purple moons, white moons sinking under one wave, black moons over the lower east side, red moons over China, skipping along one by one, bouncing over the crag horizon of Jupiter through the clip clop ethereal violin strings and the violas running through my solar plexus. They're skipping down the Hollywood streets in dust pants and 1940s nylon skirts. It's total idiocy. A new song from the tragic Fiji Island love affair. A 30-year-old teenager weeping into her brass ear. Her boyfriend has just sailed off for Korea and left her sobbing with orgasms from the Bowery in World War I. Them plunk guitars and descending melocrino. Uh, in certain moods, it could be seductive over the wingtip. It's a Mediterranean blue approaching Cleveland hung with puff clouds and Hawaiian guitars shining in the sunlight. A children's show over the low Catskills, speaking in a monstrous little voice, Pyramus and Tisby. Up here, the lion's part. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Allen Ginsberg was once called the abominable snowman of modern poetry. The man who used this phrase was his publisher, himself a poet of international fame and the owner of the City Lights bookstore in San Francisco, Lawrence Berlinghetti. Like Ginsberg, Berlinghetti is very much concerned with what is going on in the world today. The very opposite of the popular image of the poet is someone This is like only five years from reality. before he was in the Mikowski documentary. And he looks like uh, a million times different. Through some old Navy beer bottles which uh, at the moment seem to have disappeared. Uh, Contemplating the situation in the West. Dreaming of utopia. Uh, That's the beginning of a very long poem called The Situation in the West, followed by a holy proposal. I'm just uh, looking out uh, over the city last year. This poem just came out, Dreaming of Utopias, where everyone's a lover. I see San Francisco from my window, see some old navy beer bottle. The glass is dark. What's it all about? I move the ships about in my binoculars like some mad admiral. Dark, dark, dark. We are all shunted into it. A concrete creek. Freeway, pinball, labyrinth. Cars into tunnels. Dancers long gone under the hill. Kiss, kiss in stone boudoirs. The earth is turbid. Storing sexual energy. Turning them, turning into the dark under the skyscrapers with their time on top. Ticket tape time, tick, tick. Civilization and its crickets. The dark thread draws us all in, into the wind-up labyrinth. Undischarged sexual energy, not mine, the city's. There's the Fairmont Palace, there's the Mark Masturbation, there's the park, there's the cement works, there's the steam beer brewing plant, there's the bay, there's that bridge, there's that treasured island the Navy doesn't need. We need it, but we don't need the Navy. Sail away forever somewhere, why don't you? Ah, there's the sun again. There's the Hall of Justice blockhouse personifying itself, Mussolini modern. There's the sky. There's sky riding. Chalk on a mirror. What's it all about? Someone trying to trace something up there. Sun solves it in the mirror 
of eternity. A train pulls out of Third Street Station, not going anywhere. Discharge of aimless sexual energy, tick, tick, over the rails to a coupling in Palo Alto. Life goes on, not going anywhere. Time goes on, tick, tick, what's it all about? Find the tick in the labyrinth of eternity. Follow your thread around the next corner. I sometimes wonder if that is what Krishna Murthy meant. Love the lost tick and desire fails. As we grow older, the clatter becomes more complicated. Put your ear to the flesh and you'll still hear a tick, tick over the rails bearing us away. And there's a time to die. And there's a time to live. But who's got a bad ticker? And what's everything waiting for? Don't tell me they're still waiting. We've been through all that already. Even the poets dug it. You could almost hear them beginning to think. Tick, tick. Even the painters finally caught on. Pop, pop. Now it's all over, maybe. Nothing happens. Any place anymore, maybe. Especially in San Francisco, baby. Janet Whale, all over the place. Elder statesmen, poets, high and dry, flopping about out of breath. And a labyrinth, the worst place of all for a whale to find himself. How do we get out? Where do we go from here? What's the next development? What's around the next corner? Why is everything holding its breath? Why am I here, typing in my attic, turned on in my attic, holding my breath, on, on, tick, tick. I've got a good ticker. I'm winding up my thread. But I am no Prince Theseus, nor was meant to be. I'll slay no minor minotaur in my attic retreat with the sword I used to cut my meat. Still, I'm always looking for the action at the heart of things. Must be something shaking somewhere. Someone on some rooftop must be loving in the hot sun, in this labyrinth of solitude, which is neither cold Crete nor hot Mexico, but is still full of solos, gringo pachucos, trying to trace it out, trying to figure out what it's all about and why the sun still goes on turning and still is God to my dog. The sun, the sun, behold the sun. Great God, da, great God, sun, still rises in our rubaiyat and strikes the towers with a shaft of light. The sun, the sun, still rules everything, even the sky as we know it, even love as we know it, even life, which is nothing but heat, discharge of sexual energy. And there is a time to embrace, and there is a time to refrain from embracing. And the sun goes on cooling, discharge of undirected sexual energy, and the Cold War gets cooler, and desire fails, other directed sexual energy. And there is a time to hate, and there is a time to love, and there is a time to keep silence, and there is a time to speak, and two more government scientists throw in the sponge, misdirected sexual energy. But is this cooling off period to string us out forever? How about some love in the cool, cool climate? How about some instant joy? In a direct sexual energy. This poem goes on for uh, another five minutes and ends uh, after a holy proposal to solve the international crisis with this test. And blessed be the fruit of trans population. And blessed be the sun kissed world with no more nations. Hosanna, Pulchrissima, Kiri, 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 Hallelujah. We'll all still have the sun in which to recognize ourselves at last across the world over the obscene boundaries. Lawrence Ferlinghetti is a painter as well as a poet and publisher, and he holds a doctorate from the Sorbonne. His book, A Coney Island of the Mind, was first published in 1958 and is now in its 13th printing by New Directions. It is one of the most widely read books of poetry today. One of the poems concerns this very dog, whose name is Homer. That's a good dog. <coughs> the dog trots freely in the street and sees reality, and the things he sees are bigger than himself, and the things he sees are his reality. Drunks in doorways, moons on trees. The dog trots freely through the street, and the things he sees are smaller than himself. Fish on newsprint, ants in holes, chickens in Chinatown windows, their heads a block away. The dog trots freely in the street, and the things he smells smell something like himself. The dog trots freely in the street, fast puddles and babies, cats and cigars, pool rooms and policemen. He doesn't hate cops, 
He merely has no use for them. And he goes past them and past the dead cows hung up whole in front of the San Francisco meat market. He would rather eat a tender cow than a tough policeman, though either might do. And he goes past the Romeo Ravioli factory and past Coit Tower and past Congressman Doyle of the Un-American Committee. He is afraid of Coit Tower, but he's not afraid of Congressman Doyle, although what he hears is very discouraging, very depressing, very absurd to a sad young dog like himself, to a serious dog like himself. But he has his own free world to live in, his own fleas to eat. He will not be muzzled. Congressman Doyle is just another fire hydrant to him. The dog trots freely in the street and has his own dog's life to live and to think about and to reflect upon touching and tasting and testing everything, investigating everything without benefit of perjury. A real realist with a real tale to tell and a real tale to tell it with. A real live barking democratic dog engaged in real free enterprise with something to say about ontology, something to say about reality and how to see it and how to hear it with his head cocked sideways at street corners as if he is just about to have his picture taken for Richter Records, listening for his master's voice and looking like a living question mark into the great gramophone of puzzling existence with its wondrous hollow horn, which always seems just about to spout forth some victorious answer to everything. Ends perfectly. Uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg's poems, Who to be Kind to, The King of May, and New York to San Francisco, were read in part only, as was Lawrence Ferlinghetti's poem, The Situation in the West. This is Annie T the National Educational Television Network. That last Ferlinghetti poem from um, Coney Island, whatever, I can't remember what the book's called, but the one about his dog, that's great. That's such a great poem. But the, the hard thing about Ferlinghetti is, I don't know if it's because their voices are technically like lower than Anne Sexton's was, but I understood everything Ann Sexton said on her episode. This one was a bit hard. And with, with the exception of sexual energy, I had no idea what the fuck Lawrence Ferlinghetti was saying in that first poem. But what I will say, that inspired me. I'm, I'm going to do a writing tip video probably right after this. That first poem that was like super long and he even said like there's like five more minutes of this. I don't know if that's part of the poem or what. But, like, he got that just looking out the window. And in our writing Zooms, in Anarchy Crew and shit, like, we've done that before. Where it's like, look out your window. And, and I'm going to do a whole thing about this. But, like, that's just... It's so cool. Like, it's, it's a great way to see the world and your art and how your world and your art um, intertwine. So anyway, hopefully this was enjoyable for you. If you liked it, leave a thingy down below and let me know. Um, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And um, we are doing Love is a Dog from Hell and the Bukowski Book Club this month. And don't forget to pick up um, Bloodshed Review and my newest chapbook, Drinking Less as well as Winner of Your Mom's Sodomy Prize for Poetry at my Etsy shop. And then you could download the Blood Rag for free, issue 14, or all the other issues for that matter. At my website, IHateMountWall.com slash the dash blood dash rag. Okay? So, with all that said, guys, type hard. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Creo and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.